last four weeks talking about our identity in Christ and what that means, what it means collectively, and what it means individually, and how this identity in Christ is the key to God's purpose for your life. If your identity is found anywhere else other than in Christ, it's going to disappear, it's going to vaporize, it won't stand against our enemy. Because we're in a spiritual battle, and so we need to have this, and we need to snap ourselves and remind, I am in Christ. Whatever you face in Christ, you can handle it. Amen? Amen. All right. But as a friend of mine and a former teammate used to very eloquently remind myself and others, he used to say, Woohoo! What does it all mean? What does it all mean? And that's what we're going to talk about today. What does it all mean? Because after a very, very uh, compelling speech by our coach, or one of the team captains getting up and exhorting the team, he would all, he'd look across at me knowingly and kind of roll his eyes and say, what does it all mean? So what? My identity is in Christ. So what? What does that mean? What's the impact? Is it about status and identity? And the reality is that it's not. Because our identity in Christ not only has significance for us, it means a lot to the world around us. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about this idea of the second definition of champion. The second definition of champion, according to the dictionary, means this, one who fights on behalf of a king. So if you're going to be a champion, not only does it mean that you have a victory, it also means that you're going to fight for a king. You see, in Christ, we fight for our king, and that's King Jesus. This is a huge statement. We made it several weeks ago, but champions in Christ do not fight for victory. Champions in Christ fight from victory. Our battle is already won, but we're engaged in a spiritual battle. We're in a battle for souls of those people around us. You see, there's two things that we'll be able to do when we receive our internal inheritance in heaven one day. There's two things. The first thing we won't be able to do when we get to heaven is sin, okay? It's actually good news. When we receive our internal inheritance, we won't be able to sin. But the second thing that we won't be able to do is we won't be able to share the good news of Jesus Christ with the people around us. You see, our opportunity on earth is a limited time opportunity. We're not going to be here forever. And so my question is, do you care about those around you? Do you care about their eternal destiny? Because as a champion for Christ, we are to be out there fighting, not against people, but for people on behalf of our King Jesus. It's part of the reason that we're here. You see, I have to challenge you, and I have to say this. If you don't care about the eternal destiny of those around you, I would question whether you've actually been saved. If you don't care about your neighbor's eternal destiny, your friend's eternal destiny, if you don't care about where they're going to spend all of eternity, I would question if it actually has been received. Because to not care for our friend's eternal salvation, to not care about a world that's lost, that's broken, not caring for them is the equivalent of telling your neighbor that they can go to hell. And that's not what champions do. Champions have an identity that's unshakable, that's true. But champions also have a cause and a king that they need to fight for. Paul's writing to Timothy and and he highlights this. Because the Christian life is not a playground, it's a battlefield. He says this in 1 Timothy 6.12. He says, fight the good fight of faith. Fight the good fight of faith. It's a battle. When I was in college, I've shared with you this, uh, but we had a lot of things written on the locker room wall. And one of the phrases that we had was, those who stay will be champions. Those who stay will be champions. And it was true in a temporal, athletic sense. But it's much more true in an eternal, spiritual sense. Because champions have a different mindset. They have a different lifestyle. They fight differently. And that's what we're going to talk about today. You see, we fight differently as Christians 
We don't lead with arguments or logic. We lead with love and surrender. That's how we fight. We fight differently than the world fights. We battle the noise many times with silence. We come against arrogance with humility. Champions oppose selfishness with selflessness. Champions resist violence with kindness. Champions face persecution with peace. Champions endure suffering with joy. Champions fight differently. Our champion Jesus fought differently. It says in Hebrews that for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Jesus modeled nonviolent surrender and submission. He stood up to extreme opposition and death threats. He sacrificed his life willingly for our sins. Jesus fought differently. Jesus wasn't a pacifist, though I have to tell you. The Bible tells us that he actually braided a whip and he cleared out a temple. I would imagine if Jesus, in that moment, wasn't seen as a pacifist, he even cursed a fig tree, which I've always wondered. That seems kind of like random and weird. But it's in the Bible. He cursed a fig tree. Do you know why? Because it wasn't producing fruit. <laughs> Poor fig tree. But Jesus has an expectation. He has an expectation that we would take that own whip to ourselves and that we would be ones that would clear out the darkness by the power of his blood in our own lives and that we would fight back against unproduction. All of Jesus' disciples actually gave their lives so that the gospel would go forward. Through the centuries and even to modern day, saints are giving their lives for the gospel. In that realization, I think sometimes, what have I really given for Jesus? What have I really given to him? Not much. I haven't really given much at all. But I gotta tell you, who did give a lot? His name was Paul. Paul's letters to the church in Ephesus and Philippi are the letters that we've been kind of building this series on, Ephesians and Philippians, the first two chapters specifically. In fact, Paul, he fought differently as well. In fact, he had quite a transition. If you know his story, he began as an enemy of the cross. He began as an enemy of Christ. And if you have your Bibles, I'd encourage you, we're going to be in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Uh, you can open up your Bibles or click open to your Version app. You can click open to 2 Timothy chapter 2, or 2 Timothy chapter 4. And as you're turning there, I want you to understand that we're going to be reading some of the last words scholars believe that Paul ever wrote. These were his dying words to his mentee, a guy named Timothy. This is leading up to his execution. And while you're turning there, I just want to give you a little backstory. Um, in Acts chapter 7, we see Saul holding the coats of the men who crucified, or stoned, excuse me, Stephen, the first Christian martyr. In Acts chapter 9, we literally see Saul now on a seek and destroy mission against the church. He's on his way to Damas Damascus when he dramatically meets Christ. And that encounter drastically changes everything about his life and mission. He begins a process of development, becoming more like Christ, engaging with the people of God. And in Acts chapter 13, he goes on the offensive in his battle. Here are some of his battle scars that he experienced, beginning in Acts chapter 13. This is just kind of a, a list. He was severely beaten. He was stripped naked. He was stoned. Not that kind of stoned, the other kind, okay, like with rocks. Um, he was drugged in the street, he was left for dead, he was thrown in prison, shipwrecked, tortured, pretty much bullied and criticized wherever he went. Paul fought for the gospel. Paul fought differently. He was peacefully and humbly contending for the good news against incredible opposition from the Romans, from the Jews, and even from people who called themselves Christians. He was being pressed in on all sides by opposition. He was fighting the faith, contending for the gospel, and this is the context in which we get his last words to Timothy. Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. <laughs> it's a very poetic way of saying this isn't going to end in a pleasant manner. Okay. 
He, what he's saying is literally my life is going to be poured out on the ground for the gospel. Verse 7, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race and I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. You see, champions live differently. As you're taking out your notes, we're going to fill in a few things. I want to tell you a story. When I was in college, my only goal was that we would win a national championship. Five years, blood, sweat, tears, all that stuff, we came up short. <laughs> okay. Our last game senior year we lost. Never won any kind of championship at all. And after the season, I was, I was with, a, with a friend of mine uh, who I had met. He played for a team, the Northwest Missouri State Bearcats. In the time that I had lost five, he had won two. And champions behaved differently. So I was excited when I got to stay at Aaron's house. He lived in Omaha. I stayed at his house. Uh, I got to sleep in the basement. And I went into his, uh, the bathroom in the basement of his parents. It was his parents' house now. And I noticed in his medicine kit alongside the, uh, the, the, the sink there, he had his two Bearcat National Championship rings just stuffed in the, in the shaving kit. I was like, oh my goodness. Aaron, you've got two National Championship rings, and you don't even, like, do you even wear them? And he's like, no, man, I never even wear them. I don't wear those things. And I'm like, I couldn't believe it. I was like, what? <laughs> and that's all I ever wanted was a championship. And you never wear your rings? And he's like, no, man, I never wear those things. And I was like, that's different, man. If I would, I'd be wearing it everywhere. I'd be taking a shower with it on. Okay? I'd be walking around being like, check this out. But he didn't do it. Champions behave differently. Champions behave differently. And it's true in that sense. It's also true in a spiritual sense. Champions behave differently because we understand that we're fighting for a victorious king and that the battle's not over. So we don't celebrate the victories on our finger because that's not what champions do. Champions do things differently. The first thing is this, champions fight the good fight. Our battle's not against flesh and blood. Our battle is not a physical fight, it's a spiritual one. We war against the powers and principalities of this dark world. We war against the powers and principalities, the demonic spirits that press against all of humankind. I have to tell you this this morning, that our battle's not here. You might think you have an enemy that you can see, the reality is you don't. Your enemy is unseen. We live in a spiritual world. We know this because Jesus told us this in John 10.10. 10. Jesus said that your enemy has a threefold purpose. And here it is. The enemy's purpose is to steal, to kill, and destroy. Make no mistake, our enemy wants to see destruction of as many humans as he can. You see, he, know he's, he, know, he knows that he's lost, and he knows that he can't win. So what is he going to do? He's going to try to take as many as he can with him. That's what the devil does. He wants to steal your joy and your peace. He wants to steal your health and your purpose. He wants to steal your progress. He wants to kill your hope and your courage. And he wants to destroy your loved ones. And he mainly wants to do it through the power of sin. You see, unconfessed, unrepented sin in our lives has an unbelievable stifling effect. I've had the privilege of visiting with two people that I know who recently have made the choice that they're going to quit smoking. One of the men who told me this, he recently said, man, I'm doing, everything seems so much different. I can breathe better I'm not smoking anymore, so my lungs now have room to take in more oxygen. I feel better. One person told me, he said, I can actually sing now. See, smoking is kind of a lot like sinning. Now, I'm not making a statement about smoking. If you're smoking here, please, okay, I'm not calling you a sinner. Here's what I'm saying. We're all sinners. But here's what I'm saying. Smoking has a cumulative degenerative effect on your ability to take in air. Sin has a cumulative, degenerative effect to take in the Holy Spirit of God. It shrinks you up from the inside out. It's what sin does. Same thing that smoking does to your lungs, sin does 
to your soul. And so how do we push back against the sins of lust, of pride, of greed, of the flesh? How do we press back against it? We have to fight. I told you, we have to fight. We have to fight the good fight. How do we fight the good fight? We resist the enemy in Jesus' name and by his blood. Okay? Here, I want to teach you how to do this. You can pray. You can pray in the Spirit of God by the name of Jesus. If there's something coming against you, you pray, in Jesus' name, get behind me, Satan. Okay? So you're, you're in a situation where you sense a spiritual force moving on against you. You say, in Jesus' name, you have no permission. Take authority against that spirit and speak to it. And say, you have no permission in this life because it's covered by the blood of Jesus. Pray in his name and pray his blood. And take authority over the spiritual world. We have to fight. That's what it looks like to fight in the spirit. We have to do that. How can we do this? How can we fight? Well, I got to tell you, it's a battle. Okay? It's a journey. It's a marathon. You can do it by immersing yourself in the word of God. Get in this book every day. Ask the Holy Spirit to fill you. Receive the power of the Holy Spirit. Surrender yourself then to that spirit. Cover yourself with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. If you've not been baptized, now we invite people to baptism all the time. This morning, I'm making it as a strong recommendation. If you call yourself a follower of Christ and you've not been publicly baptized, I want to encourage you to do that, okay? Because when you identify in that way powerfully with the body and the blood of Christ, guess what happens? You literally get covered for a spiritual battle. It's an unbelievable opportunity. we got to fight. I'd encourage you to surround yourself with godly people. Okay? Give yourselves a hand. You came today, even on a nasty day. That's a good thing. Okay? You showed up to be around God's people. That's great. I'd encourage you to get in a life group. And, and for a minute, I want to speak to the people in our church that are actually in a life group. A lot of times, we, I, I invite people to get into a life group. Here's some of the feedback I've heard. Well, how do I do it? That kind of hurts me. I'm like, oh my goodness. Okay? We need to get in. Here's what I want to challenge all of you that are in life groups. I want to challenge you to make an invitation to someone who's not in a life group. If you're in a life group and you meet someone or you connect with someone that doesn't have one, invite them in. Okay? Invite them in. Reach out and bring someone in to help build into them. Be open. Do you have an open seat at your group? Hey, do you have an open place in your heart, in your home for someone else that needs that community? Surround yourselves with godly people. That's how we fight. Champions fight. They choose the cause of Christ because it's more beneficial than the conflict. Here's what Paul says in Philippians chapter 1. Verse 27, we're going we're to read one part together, but he says this. Whatever happens, okay, whatever happens, Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I have come and see you or only hear about your absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved. And that by God. Verse 29, for it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, we like that, don't we? We like to talk about belief, but also to suffer for him. Since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had and now hear that I still have. See, it begins with belief. But it leads into a battle. It leads to a battle. Champions have to fight the good fight. This is Paul writing again. We need to fight the good fight. Here's number two. Champions finish the race. They fight the good fight. Champions finish the race. Starters are a dime a dozen. Finishers are one in a million. If we are in the last days, then God's chosen us to be his anchor leg. 
Starters are a dime a dozen. Finishers are one in a million. We need to finish the race. Number three is this. Champions keep the faith. We hope in affliction. We hope in accusation. We hope, no matter what's happening, we hope. What's stronger than the battle going around us? What's stronger than the enemy? What's stronger than that is hope. And we put our hope in Christ. We have to surrender our fleshly understandings and put our hope in Jesus Christ. It's what we talked about during Advent, that hope is the antidote to the problems of our world. We need to hope in Christ. We need to raise our vision, and we need to live out the God-sized vision that he has for us. And the fourth one is this. It's the fourth key to being a champion. Here's what champions do. They focus on the finish. Champions focus on the finish. When I was a senior in high school, my brother and I got a crazy idea that we were going to jump out of an airplane. Kind of like a bucket list type of a deal. Like we wanted to do it to say we could do it. Pretty much, you know, we thought it would help us get girls. Um, It didn't. Dana didn't care. But we thought it would help. So we did it. And I remember on the way up, I'm I'm getting scared. And my brother looked at me. He goes, he's got blonde hair. like to hear it's flowing in the wind. He goes, man, are you ready? And I'm like, no. He's like, it's okay, man. You just got to unplug your body from your brain. (laughs) And so we did. We we, we jumped out of a perfectly normal airplane. It was great. Uh, But as years passed, I realized, well, that's not that courageous of a thing. That's not going to impress anybody. What I need to do is I need to run a marathon. Now, that's going to impress some people. And so I got this crazy idea. I thought, you know what? I'm going to run a marathon. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Now, I use the word run in the broadest possible sense. Because really, as I got into the training with my buddy Steve, Steve informed me, he said, John, you're not going to run this whole race. You're going to probably need to walk. Because you're what we call in the marathon world, a Clydesdale. (laughs) Now, apparently, to marathon runners, that's kind of a diss. But to me, I was like, Clydesdale? Hmm, I like the sounds of that. (laughs) And sure enough, uh, thanks to God's grace and a 40-degree day, I was able to complete the Chicago Marathon. Complete it. In the 22nd mile, I got passed by a lady that could have been my grandmother. She's like, come on, Sonny, you can do it. It was a very humbling experience, but the reason, my goal was not a time. I didn't have a certain time. My goal was to get through to the finish. That was my only goal. I didn't care what I finished in, and so in just under a standard work day, I was able to finish the marathon. (laughs) Okay. Um... And when I got to the end, it was interesting because everything in my mind was focused on the finish. And I crossed the finish line, and it was like, yes. And then I found out I had three and a half miles back to the hotel without a taxi or a bus or a shuttle or anything. So when I got to the end, I really wasn't at the end. I still had three miles to get back to the bed. It was crazy, but my, my focus in that was not on how I, how I would finish. My focus was on that I would finish. And Paul tells us that that's really the key to to a championship mindset. We need to determine that we're going to focus on the finish and the reward that's in heaven, not the reward that's here on earth. You you see in verse 8 him talking about the ultimate prize. And for a Christian, the ultimate prize will never happen this side of heaven. In the course of this series, um, I've had to say goodbye to my grandmother. 94 years old, she passed away. My mom called me on a Sunday night and asked that we pray that Grandma would go home and that God would take her home. And within less than six hours, she was home. And so I got to experience the beauty of Bev Nick going home to be with Jesus. And on Tuesday at 2.30 in the afternoon in Freud, Montana, uh, which is just a little over 11 hours from here, Grandma Bev is going to go into the ground. It's probably going to be about as hard as this concrete, but her body is going to go to its resting place. You see, her spirit's already with Jesus in heaven. But some of her family are going to be there. Not all of them can make it. I don't even know if I'm going to be able to make it. But they're going to be there to say goodbye to the person that they remembered and loved. She will receive no newspaper article. She's not going to get a plaque. She won't get any kind of recognition. In fact, me speaking her name to you you are more than most people. Most people don't know who my grandma is. But Jesus does. And guess what? 
she's receiving her reward for a life of faithful service to her king. She's, she's my hero. She's my hero because she fought the good fight. She didn't play for the audience of her family or her community. She played for an audience of one. And because of that, she's my hero, and I'm proud to say that she's my grandmother. See, who are you going to play the game for? Are you going to play it for the approval of men and women? Or are you going to play it for the approval of Jesus Christ? You've got to focus on the finish. And if your finish is here on earth, getting to heaven is not going to be what you think it is. Because as champions, we fight for the king, the eternal king, Jesus. That's who we're playing for. And so we're going to offer a prayer. That's something that I wrote, but I didn't write it on my own. I, I took it actually from one of Paul's letters. And we're going to invite you in this moment to receive the Holy Spirit. Because it's one thing to surrender your life, but it's another thing to open yourself up to the Spirit of God. And so in this prayer, I'm going to ask you, you can pray it to yourself right where you're seated. Uh, you, I just ask you to close your eyes and bow your head. We're going to pray this prayer. And this is a prayer of commitment. It's a prayer of reception. It's a prayer of, of repenting and turning from the ways of this world. Father, we come to you in prayer. A prayer of commitment. Because as champions, we, we need to make a commitment. And right now, I will commit to living a life worthy of the calling that I've received. I will strive to be more humble, gentle, and patient, bearing with my brothers and sisters in love. I will do my absolute best to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. For there is one body, one Spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, and one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, including me, through all, and in all. But Father, I confess today I can't do it without your grace, without your power. I need you. So in this moment, I would ask that you would empty me. Everything in me that's of me, I let go. I see it flowing out of my body to let it go. The sin, the hurt, the pain, I just let it go. And the space that's left over, the void inside of me, I want to be filled by your spirit. And so right now I receive your spirit. By faith, I'm filled by your Spirit. And it's in this moment, as Paul said, that we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching, by the cunning and craftiness of the people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, Paul writes, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become, in every respect, the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. For from him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. This is our prayer. It's my prayer for our church, that we would begin to understand what it means to be filled, to be empowered by the Holy Spirit of God, that we would become the literal hands and feet of Jesus in our community. I believe our church has unlimited capacity under the influence, through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. May we grow in that. May we become mature as the body of Christ.
pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. As we sing, I'd invite you to sing along to this song, continuing to invite the Holy Spirit to be in our lives.